Hi, I'm Peter Charles here of Hooked for Life Fly Fishing, and today we're going to do a video about videos. Now, I've done one already which talked about the general process, but I didn't get into any technicalities at all, and I did get some questions afterwards about the technical aspects of what I do. So I thought I'd put in a video that dealt more about the technical side of the videography, and I think it might be useful or of interest to some people. Let's start with the lighting. I've got three lights here. I've got a main light, I have a side light, I have what they call a hair light, uh, and that's typical three-point lighting that you would see in a photo shoot or video. That's quite typical. Nothing unusual there. But I also have the, the problem of trying to light the, uh, the fly as well. So I have a, a panel down low which lights the fly, and I have another panel up here that lights the fly. And those two panels uh, give me all-around lighting on the fly, so as I'm turning the fly around, uh, it doesn't matter which camera is looking at it, the, ca the fly is fully illuminated, so, which is quite useful. Uh, the other thing I do with the, the lighting is I've got under desk lighting here, and you'll see in the corners, you see it lights up. And the purpose of those lights is that green screen I have behind me. That screen, that's, I pull that right down, it covers complete area here, uh, full coverage for the green screen, and I need to light that so there's no shadows. Uh, if they get any shadows, then I have problems with uh, green screening in whatever I want to put in there. The other thing I've got back here is just this plain background to make it easy uh, for people to read any text. It's not distracting, but it's sort of a mottled brown, gray charcoal. So it's not boring. Uh, it's not like it was a flat color. So that makes life a little bit in, more interesting. Um, as far as the color of the lights are concerned, I use 5500K um, LEDs, 5500 Kelvin, which is daylight. And my camera uh, white balances are also set to 5600 in this case, uh, Kelvins. Uh, I don't allow or don't use auto white balance. It makes a mess of everything. So uh, I have consistent color balance with my cameras and my lights, so I never run into any kind of color balance problem. In fact, I think it's a good point to say that everything on my cameras runs on manual. I never do anything on autofocus. It's just way too much of a pain. I mean, even this one that I'm holding in my hand is on manual. I mean, if you go auto, you're into big trouble at times. But what about the cameras? Okay, up here I've got an X-T20 uh, Fuji by Fujifilm. Uh, the one in front of me, uh, the... Um, my close-up camera here is a, a Fujifilm X-T3, and the one looking at me is a Fujifilm X-T2. So that's three different kinds of Fujifilm cameras, but they all have the same sensor, the 24 megapixel sensor. What's important about that is it gives me very consistent color and very consistent exposure uh, with the three cameras. I don't have to worry about variations. I used to have three different manufacturers, three different sensors, three different, everyth three different everything, and it was always a mess trying to get everything to look the same. Now I don't have that problem anymore. I have the identical sensor in all three cameras, and I have the color balance in the lights, and I'm good to go. The exposures are spot on, nothing changes, everything is great. And the other thing with these cameras is the old cameras I was using, they ha I couldn't get away without some functions being on automatic. Uh, it was built right into the cameras. I couldn't do anything about it. Now I can run these fully on, auto, on manual. I don't have to worry about it. Now, as far as uh, lenses are concerned, I have uh, this Olympus uh, 80 millimeter bellows lens on an auto tube. This gives me uh, a good close-up uh, capability. It can go greater than life size. This is an old film lens. Okay, all my lenses are old film lenses. Some of them as much as 40 years old. Uh, the one up here is a, a Micro Nikkor 105. Uh, that's a very, very useful lens for giving me a wider view. As you can see with this particular view of the fly, I can see the entire fly, despite that thing being about three inches long. Now, if I want a tighter uh, view of the fly, I've got this 200 Micro Nikkor here that I can use to get a much closer view of the fly. So I can come in tight on about half that fly and I will see the whole thing. So if I'm dealing with a small fly, a small trout wet fly, for example, we get a good clear view of it. So I, I swap those out depending on the view I want. 
I also have this little guy here, which is uh, an old Torquina uh, zoom, and it's a two-ring zoom, which is important if you're doing video. And that gives me a wide view of my desk surface. So I can put that lens up here, and I end up with um, you know a much wider view. If I'm doing product work or I've got a rod on the desk, it works fine. On the camera in front of me, that uh, Fujifilm X-T2, I've got an old uh, Minolta uh, 24 to 35 two ring zoom. And uh, you know, it gives me excellent, uh, excellent quality, very easy to control. Everything manual, uh, aperture rings, manual focus, manual zoom. And you know, watch every you set the lens on, it stays that way. I don't have to ever worry when I sit down that my lens, the auto function on my lens has done something that I don't expect. I always get consistent results by using, you know, manual lenses. So I've got some other manual lenses over in the corner if I need to bring them out for any reason. But these are the, the ones I use. The Olympus 80 mm uh, the Micronicer 1 of 5 that's on there right now, or the 200, or that old 28 to 70 zoom, and I've got the 24 to 35 in front of me. Now, in terms of audio, that's a big problem for me. I'm going to shut up for a moment. I want you to listen. You hear that hum? That's a refrigerator upstairs. I can't do very much about that, unfortunately. It is what it is. Um, I, I can't soundproof my basement. I mean, I have to live with the ambient noise that's around here. So as a consequence, I went to this uh, dynamic mic. Normally you would use a condenser mic for this job, but I'm using a dynamic mic here because it has a, a, a super cardioid pattern. It's a rather tight pattern. So it tends to minimize background noise. If I was using a, a, a condenser mic or a ribbon mic, I'd be picking up a lot more of that background noise and it would be much more irritating. Yes, I can take it out in software, but when you do, you always lose something. I mean, I can put noise suppression or I can do hum removal, but you're still going to, you know, it t tends to make the, the rest of the auto sound a bit tinny. So it's something I have to live with, but having a dynamic mic with a tighter pattern helped me out there. Now, to control my mic is a little mixer here. I don't really need the little mixer, but it does make my life a little easier. I can control my, uh, the gain very, very tightly. I can avoid distortion other problems and get clean audio without any difficulties. Now, the other the thing that's interesting is I don't run any of the audio or the recording in the cameras. That brings another set of problems. What I have instead is these three Atomos units. Um, they've got not only the HDMI out from each camera, but also the audio out from the mixer. So all my audio and my video is being recorded in these Atomos units. I'm not doing any recording in the cameras at all. Now, what it does, it takes the HDMI out from the camera, goes to the recorder, and then it goes to the monitors, which I'll show you in a moment. So it, these Atomos units uh, have SSDs in them, and I can record for hours. And because the cameras are outputting uh, HDMI, they're actually a higher quality than what you would record in the camera. For those of you who know what color space is, uh, normally they record to an SD card at uh, 420 uh, and the color space on these HDMI outs is 422, which is 50% more color signal. Or if you look at the other way around, it's 100% more color signal than a 420 signal. So I get a lot more color information by using the HDMI out and I'm not limited to the size of the SD card. I can put these big uh, SSDs in the uh, Atomos units and just record for hours and hours straight. All three cameras are on a, running on AC, they're not running on battery. So again, I can just run for hours. I don't have overheating problems, nothing. You know, you get overheating problems with your batteries. You don't when you're running through AC. So, you know, I can literally hear, sit here and talk and babble on for hours and hours and hours and, you know, never have to worry about running out of space or running out of battery. So that's an important consideration. The Atomos units have given me a lot of freedom and they've made my life very easy. The last thing I'm gonna talk about is the monitors. And you can see, I'm looking at myself there. Uh, you can see that I move the camera. You can see the, in that top monitor on the camera, uh, you can see me moving around. And then I have these two other monitors giving me the top view and the side view. And that view is what you would see 
as uh, uh, an observer. If you were in front of me watching me tie, that's the view you would see. Um, so I have these two monitors, the two big monitors to show the fly, and the little monitor, which is like a headshot monitor, that shows me what the camera is seeing. So I'm looking at myself, basically, when I'm recording a video. Uh, it's important to have these monitors so you can actually see what the output uh, is going to look like as you're actually working on the fly. Now, as far as the, the rest of the desk is concerned, uh, I have this little panel in front of me uh, that uh, allows me to uh, shoot against a panel instead of shooting against my shirt, which can be distracting. And I also, in software, I flip uh, the fly around so it points the right way. So it doesn't look like one camera is pointing this way and one camera is pointing that way with the fly. The fly is not facing in different directions. So it gives me the ability to have a consistent background to the fly. And it looks nice. You know, I, I just like the look of it. Um, I've gone with this tomato orange just to give it something distinct. So when you're looking through the YouTube um, uh, thumbnails, you see that tomato orange, you know it's me. So it's, it's easy. It's a, it's a signature. It's not ideal. I mean, there are flies that use a lot of orange, kind of disappear against it. But, you know, it's something I live with. So I... Uh, the other thing is, you know, like I've got all my materials stacked alongside here. I've got enough desk space to make sure I've got, uh, you know, my material stacked up, my tools, everything's at hand. I don't have to worry about, you know, running around grabbing stuff because my fly tying desk is way over there. So you can't go running over there all the time. But every once in a while you have to. So that's uh, the technical side of my uh, video setup. Um, it's very easy to do. You'll notice my production of videos has gone up over the past year. Well, ma making these changes has enabled me to do that. By making the whole process slicker and less prone to error, I can knock out videos much quicker. I mean, there's been videos that have had technical problems that got, just got deleted. I had to restart. The, that has just dropped to almost zero now. Uh, my videos are very consistent technically because, you know, this is stable. It's, it just works. So... That's a little bit about me shooting videos, the technical side of it. If you want to know anything more about the technicalities, you can always pop a question in there. I'm primarily a still photographer. Uh, and in fact, you know, as you can see, I've got my little street photography camera here, my X100V, and I've got an X-T3 that's over there that I'm shooting this particular shot on. So, as I say, any questions, pop them in the comments, and that's how I shoot videos. Cheers.